thanks everyone for being here. My name is Paul Crane. I'm at the University of Richmond uh, School of Law. Uh, that was at the University of Chicago for a stint. So Richard commenting on my paper will not be at least a novel enterprise. <laughs> Um, so my paper is called uh, Incorporating Collateral Consequences into Criminal Procedure. And I sort of think of it having sort of two main parts. The first part is, to me, what is this sort of puzzle, which is the following. It's pretty well recognized now that collateral consequences of conviction, just clear on what those are, things like immigration consequences, sex offender registration, things outside your direct punishments, are a really important outcome in a tremendous number of criminal cases. And they impact and influence how prosecutors prosecute cases, how defense attorneys advise their clients, the impact on their clients. Right? They're a real integral part of the criminal justice system, for better or worse right now. At the same time, the criminal procedures that are allocated to criminal defendants <coughs> barely, if at all, factor in the collateral consequences that might stem from a conviction. So if you think about the right to counsel, the right to a jury trial, right to discovery, preliminary hearing, grand jury, it is all based on imprisonment, either potential or actual. Now I think the sort of most prevalent explanation for this universe as it exists now is, well, collateral consequences are just outside the criminal justice process. And I think there's something to that, but the first part of the paper actually tries to poke some holes in that. And it does so by noting that actually collateral consequences do play a role in other criminal justice doctrines. For example, whether a case is moot. Since the 1940s, the Supreme Court has recognized that a case does not become moot so long as there's collateral consequences, even if you've served your prison time. Padilla, more recently, involving ineffective assistance of counsel, recognized you know, defense counsel need to advise, at least in certain circumstances, about immigration consequences. And there's a couple others. And so what I try to offer is, at least to me, an underappreciated reason, underappreciated reason, which is it's really complicated and messy to try and take a system that is built on one clean metric, prison time, and then take hundreds of potential collateral consequences and try to weave them into different criminal procedure doctrines. And judges are understandably quite reluctant to do so, especially without explicit guidance. And so the lower courts, particularly in the last few years, that are getting increasingly claims of, I should have an attorney because I'm facing deportation. I should have a jury trial because I'm losing my right to possess a firearm. Judges are usually just saying, this is a mess. And I think that's right. And I actually think that is, as much as anything, doing a lot of work explaining why this sort of, at least to me, outdated uh, universe of cloud consequences are really important, except when we talk about the procedures that are allocated to defendants. So then the second half of the paper, as any good academic, I raise a problem and then try to solve it, uh, is try to ease the concerns uh, and ease the incommensurability difficulties that comes to incorporating collateral consequences. And so I set forth a proposed framework that has sort of three main steps. And sort of as a preliminary remark, I just want you to, I approach it with otherwise trying to uh, leave all the existing doctrine in place as much as possible. So for example, take the right to a jury trial as an example. You have a right to a jury trial if you face more than six potential months of imprisonment. If you face less than six months, you have a rebuttable presumption that you don't, unless there's other big statutory penalties, which is, again, a sort of a nod that the court has sometimes recognized collateral consequences. I'm not advocating for anything different. I'm trying to take those lines where I find them, the lines that divide whether you get the right or whether you don't. And the first step of this sort of proposed framework, which would apply right by right, each individual right you would, I would um, propose you look at uh, um, in isolation, is to try and identify the theory underlying the doctrine that allocates the right at issue. So again, take the jury, tri jury trial right, for example, at least up to this point, the way the Supreme Court has explained their analysis, the reasoning is 
we look at the perspective of the legislature that passed the relevant offense, and they, that perspective determines whether an offense is relatively severe or not. And we're, we don't take it from the perspective of the defendant, for example. Some rights look at actual imprisonment, others look at potential imprisonment. There's a series, and won't go into detail now, sort of a series of questions to try and identify what's the theory underlying each right, whether it's right to a jury trial or right to counsel. The second step is now having identified whatever that theory is for dividing amongst defendants who gets the right, is which collateral consequences are eligible. And not every single one should be eligible. So again, just sort of relying on the jury trial right. Because it says, at least the doctrine thus far has said, look to the legislature that passed the offense and whether they thought it was severe based on the penalties that attached, that would mean, for example, in a state court conviction, a state court offense, that might otherwise trigger deportation and immigration consequences, immigration consequences under my framework should not be considered because that's a federal penalty, not a state one. Now, the most recent sort of state Supreme Court cases, of which there's two in the last six months, one out of DC and one out of New York, have reached a contrary conclusion, saying immigration consequences do trigger a jury trial right. But you'd go through having identified the theory of the right and then determine which collateral consequences are eligible. And then the third step is to basically do the relative severity analysis. And by that, I mean, again, we'll use the jury trial right as an example. If it's more than six months imprisonment, you get a jury trial right. Well, what I'd propose is you take whatever collateral consequences are still eligible for consideration, and you try to think of some, you try to, I'd, I'd figure out the functional equivalent prison time for the respective collateral consequence. Now, it, some of that is going to require uh, approximation. But in criminal procedure, there's really only sort of four categories that traditionally matter. Either no time in prison, between one day and six months, between six months and one year, and more than one year. Just about every criminal procedural entitlement is either triggered or not triggered based on one of those lines. And so take the cloud consequences, and I work through at least my theory in the paper, of which category, which box do these cloud consequences, each one sort of fall into. You then take whatever the line is as best you um, can divine, combine it with whatever category the collateral consequence falls into, and that triggers or doesn't. And the last part of the paper is just applying that framework to the right to a jury trial and right to counsel as sort of examples. I recognize that some of it's going, there will be reasonable disagreement on every step of the way. And I actually think that enterprise would be great. That would be people at least would be talking about it and trying to sort out the difficulties. And over time, courts would probably reach some sort of consensus out of need, if nothing else. And that, to me, is a better world than just simply saying, this is difficult, messy. Let's not get into it. Oh. OK, well, Paul cedes a minute to you, Jennifer. So You're going to use it more wisely than me. <laughs> So I'm Jennifer Mascott. I'm at the Scalia Law School, and uh, my project is titled The Ratifier's Theory of Officer Accountability. My project may be at a slightly uh, earlier stage than some of the other papers here, but I'm interested in taking a look and, and writing about the early understanding of officer accountability in part as a follow-up to a project that I published this past year looking at the meaning of the phrase officer of the United States in the Appointments Clause, and I looked at a lot of... Um, uses of, of the phrase and the term officer in a lot of founding era documents, it, which suggested that the phrase is has a, is a lot broader, encompasses a lot more officials than we think of currently, um, including probably every federal official responsible for an ongoing duty. And one of the reasons that the appointments clause uh, mechanism is in place in the Constitution, according to some of this early research, was to provide transparency and accountability. So the appointments clause said, you know, if you're an officer of the United States, you have to be appointed by the president, department head, or 
a court of law. And so the idea was that um, if if most government officials have in the executive branch have to be picked by the president or department head, um, rather actually than encouraging patronage, that would encourage the opposite responsibility and officer selection because everybody would know who to blame if that appointment did not did not work out. In the course of doing that project, one of the sources that I did not mine um, as comprehensively, partly because it's just so vast and partly because um, it doesn't actually, th these sources don't say a whole lot directly on point with the appointments clause are the ratification debates. Um, Elliot's records of the ratification debates. And so I decided in this follow-on project to look more broadly at theories at the ratif at time of ratification of how the federal government was to, was to be held accountable, how officers was to be were to be held accountable, and try to build and kind of build up and zoom out a little bit from the from the project that I did last year, honing in just on the appointments clause. Um, and so in the ratification debates, um, you know, the word officers used to refer to a lot a lot of times elected officials, president, Congress. Um, if you and I'm I'm actually just part way through looking at the sources now. So this research is based on the Virginia debates, which are themselves quite robust. There are about 600 pages in the ratification debates. The project will build out and look at um, the whole collection of the debates when it's done. But um, what I'm finding so far is that you can look at the accountability mechanisms that the ratifiers had in mind under three broad headings. You know, first electoral accountability, then second, a number of different structural mechanisms. And then third, there actually was quite a bit of thinking about how individual governmental actors would be held accountable for misdeeds or if they turned out to be to be corrupt. So um, a lot of those accountability mechanisms are familiar to us, so I thought I would just kind of highlight a couple of things um, that I found interesting so far in the ratification debates that may actually have some implications, I think, for modern contemporary discussions. And so the first, obviously, electoral accountability is quite important. I mean, I think we all know that, but if you look at how our government's structured now and the amount of power that's being exercised by people underneath the president within administrative agencies who don't actually have direct lines of accountability back up to the president, we sort of almost have switched to this alternative governmental accountability mechanism of kind of independent expertise and really at the at the at the ratification time of ratification it was quite important that everybody be who's exercising power be accountable back to the people and so um, the ratifiers talk about obviously elections being the source of legitimacy of actors such as the president Congress judges of course have much more indirect um, accountability there because they're <laughs> appointed by elected officials. But there's also a lot of discussion about the percentage or the share of the power that's going to be held even among elected officials between the House, Senate, and President being proportionate to how directly um, elected they are. So the House members directed um, by popular election every two years, obviously the senators by state legislatures and the president by the electoral college. And so in contrast to sometimes how power is playing out now, there was a lot of discussion about how the House was supposed to hold a, ma a massive share of the power, Congress do the policy making, and then references to the president holding a much more minor share of the power. And part of the reason is because if the House members had to go back every two years and be elected, we were a lot more confident they were going to be coming up with rules to bind private citizens that were going to be not too oppressive. Um, and so it, um, it's, it was also reflected um, in some of the structural mechanisms that um, the ratifiers and the framers uh, put into place with the House obviously having to have revenue-related uh, legislation originate there, power of impeachment. And so the, the, um, the thought of the ratifiers, and we'll see how this plays out descriptively, I think over history it has not played out this way, you know, with the change in power just today with the House being now held in different hands, different political party than the president, the ratifiers thought that by having the impeachment power and the revenue power, the House would virtually always prevail in these disputes with the president over the direction of the country, uh, which I think often has turned out not to be the case. But you can at least still see the general idea that the policy was going to be made by the people who could more easily lose um, lose their seats in an election. I think it has it, that would ha and, and the paper will um, play out the kind of implications that that has even for do uh, doctrines now that we're currently debating this term in the Supreme Court, the non-delegation doctrine. You know, tip the idea that um, the people cannot. Maybe Congress can't further subdelegate power that it's gotten from the people to the president to make policy to fill in as many of the details um, in big pieces of legislation um, under the original structure of the Constitution, not just because Article I vests legislative power in the president but, or in Congress, but even more fundamentally because um, policy, big policy decisions need to be made by people who are reflecting um, the interest uh, nationwide, regionwide, um, er elected every two years. Um, 
in the House of Representatives. So moving to the structural accountability mechanisms, obviously key ones there are separation of powers, federalism, which we're all really familiar with. Um, but there was also a lot of discussion even back then about the need for transparency, some concern maybe that the Constitution didn't provide enough by just requiring Congress to publish journals from time to time because of wanting the public to be able to get a record of what was happening on a regular basis in Congress and wanting um, the public just to be able to know what know what was happening there. Also, there's a lot of discussion um, about the possible structural um, play. Not that this would be constitutionally required, but some of the more influential ratifiers like James Madison and Min Pendleton, Governor Randolph, thought that um, contrary to what we think today, that the federal government perhaps should be constrained by choosing to use state officers to carry out federal power uh, with tax collection, with customs collection, because today we sort of think if the federal government conscripts state officers to do things, it's going to be commandeering the states, it's going to be abusive and oppressive. At the time, the thinking was, you know, we don't have a federal government structure in place. If we don't get these federal officers on board in the first place, we're going to have a much smaller federal operation to be oppressing the rest of the country. Um, so that actually played out in the opposite way in the first Congress where there was quite a large customs collection structure put into place early on. Um, so obviously these founders did not end up being um, descriptively correct or, or have a prediction that people decided to follow. But I think it's that's also has modern implications for the constitutional implications that we think in our anti-commandeering doctrines. Maybe now as a policy matter, it's good not to have the federal government conscript state officers. But, you know, Judd Campbell's, I think, done the bulk of the work on this. But even in the ratification debates, there's just more evidence that at least some people did not, um, thought it could be constitutionally beneficial um, at the time, not constitutionally problematic for the federal government to use state officials. And then finally, with accountability mechanisms for individual officers, um, you know, a lot of discussion of the importance of taking the oath of office this, which is fairly straightforward, although if you play that out, you know, that could have implications possibly for privatization of government functions, how much can be done by people who haven't taken the oath. Um, there's a lot of discussion, obviously, of impeachment. Um, but interestingly, to tie this back to the debate we just had at lunch, um, a lot of the ratifiers are concerned impeachment does not go far enough. You know, it doesn't extend to petty offenses by small, lower level officers. Are people really, really going to make people go to Washington to get the House to um, impose impeachment proceedings every time something goes wrong? And the answer that gives these ratifiers comfort signing on to the Constitution is, well, we've got the system in place already for common law liability against um, governmental actors, federal folks can be brought into state court, just like we've done all along. And so again, nobody there is saying, at least not in the statements I've read so far, that it's constitutionally required to have common law a, a liability against federal actors. But there's again, just this understanding that part of what makes the system work is that that exists. One other interesting tidbit that just comes up uh, briefly referenced in the Virginia debates also is another individual accountability mechanism was the idea of posting bond. Uh, many officers at the time before they could hold office had to post bond. If you had to, uh, and this, so the first congressional statutes carry this into place and make this part of the federal system. So if you were gonna handle money in the federal government, you first had to post bond so that you could have that money obviously taken back if you mishandled funds. So the treasurer of the United States had to post $150,000 in bond before taking office. Customs collectors did, and statutorily it differed based on how important of a port you oversaw. Um, federal marshals um, had to post $20,000 bond as well. And that again ties back into this understanding of common law liability, where one of the things that was going to happen, at least with the federal marshals bond, is that if that marshal or his deputy did something wrong, um, citizens could collect against that bond by bringing suit in court. So I think um, the paper's goal is, is, is partly a descriptive goal of, I think, just putting into one place, at the time that the Constitution was put into place, what did the people who made the Constitution the source of law that governs us think were going to be the mechanisms for restraining federal government? And, um, and when we think about that and, and look at how far we've come today and what do these um, early understandings tell us about um, maybe what things we're doing now have, have differed, should be done, should be done better, should be done differently, and sometimes are just plain unconstitutional, which is probably the case in, in at least in terms of how much power Congress right now delegates to um, the executive branch. So I look forward to your comments. Thank you. Can I go ahead?
Go for it, Don. Thanks. Um, Elon Werman, uh, doing a VAP at Arizona State University. Uh, so my paper is, at the moment, titled The Origins of Substantive Due Process. Uh, so we had a whole panel on this this morning. So uh, you're all initiated. So I'll just uh, keep the background brief. But uh, what I'll do is briefly draw what I think are the battle lines in the debate and then explain uh, what my paper tries to do. Uh, so I'm, I might be interpreting uh, the statements of today's speakers a bit differently than they were presenting them, but I think on one hand we have the Chapman-McConnell uh, thesis, which is effectively uh, a procedural due process thesis. Uh, this position basically says that due process of law only requires that there be a general and prospective law that exists, a violation of which is adjudicated according to a certain minimum of procedures before someone could be deprived of life, liberty, or property. Uh, this uh, has been described as substantive, but if it's substantive, it's substantive only in a very uninteresting sense. If it's substantive, then I don't see a difference between substantive due process and procedural due process. I mean, it's substantive in the sense that there must be a law. Congress has to have acted. Uh, someone has to violate that law. And then uh, that violation has to be, and Congress can't abrogate whatever those minimum procedures are, So, if which is inherent in the concept of procedural due process. So I consider this the procedural due process thesis. On the other hand, we have what I call uh, or think are true substantive due process uh, scholars or advocates like Ryan Williams, who we also heard from, David Mayer, James Eli, Howard Gilman, David Bernstein, and most recently, Randy Barnett and Evan Burnick. Uh, we heard from Randy earlier today. And these scholars, uh, I take it, are, are trying to show that there were antebellum legal antecedents uh, to substantive due process of the kind that there are general limitations on a state power. And so what my paper tries to do is to take a, a fresh look, a different look at these uh, antebellum legal cases. And my finding is, my con conclusion is that uh, I don't think they support the substantive due process thesis. I don't think they support general limitations uh, on state power. What I found is that in the antebellum legal doctrine, legal cases, there were three distinct police power doctrines, none of which uh, applied to the state legislatures themselves uh, in, the, in the sense of modern substantive due process. And so I'll go through the, th uh, so, so what happened, just to kind of take away the, give away the game, I think in the 1880s and 1890s, under the guise of due process of law, the Supreme Court conflated these three doctrines and, and created uh, um, this uh, uh, substantive due process doctrine as a limitation on the state legislatures generally. And, and I think that was a, a mistake, uh, though we might be able to get to it with the Privileges or Immunities Clause, which I'll get to. But so the three legal doctrines, the first and the most important one, involves municipal corporations. State courts did routinely invalidate the legislative acts of cities, towns, and boroughs, of municipalities. And they did so on two rationales. Uh, the first was a non-delegation rationale. The municipal corporations had strictly limited delegated powers from the state legislature uh, for uh, usually the, the police powers, health, safety, morals, but sometimes uh, there was other stuff in the delegation and th this delegation was strictly construed. This rationale does not apply to acts of the state legislatures themselves. The second rationale was that these municipalities were municipal corporations and the courts applied the common law of corporations to them. According to the common law of corporations in this period, courts could and did and routinely did void uh, corporate acts for being unreasonable in restraint of trade or in excess of the powers uh, delegated to the corporation. None of these rationales apply to the state legislatures uh, themselves and in case after case after case involving municipal bylaws, um, the court said the state legislature if it expressly authorized this unreasonable regulation, we will have no choice but to uphold it. And in several cases where there was this explicit authorization, they did. So I wanted to quote briefly from Austin v. Murray, which we heard from this morning. This is the municipal bylaw case uh, from Charlestown, uh, Massachusetts, where uh, they prohibited the bringing in of the dead into the town and the interment of the dead into the town. This was struck down on both of these rationales. Uh, so the non-delegation rationale, uh, quote, there is nothing in the language of the statute from which it can be inferred that it was the intention of the legislature to delegate to the selectmen and town of Charlestown the power of imposing upon the citizens of the Commonwealth such an unreasonable restraint. It was a delegation rationale that did not apply to the state legislature itself. Second, a bylaw to be valid must be reasonable. That's a quote. Uh, there isn't a, a clear explanation of the origins of of this doctrine uh, in, in that case, but Chief Justice Savage uh, in New York uh, it gives in a different municipal bylaw case uh, the explanation. At common law, corporations have power to make bylaws for the general good of the corporation. 
They must be reasonable and for the common benefit. They must not be in the restraint of trade, nor impose a burden without apparent benefit. But again, in case after case after case, the court said if the state explicitly allowed these unreasonable bylaws or restraints of trade, the, the courts had to uphold them. Uh, so I don't think this doctrine supports a substantive due process thesis. However, there were two other police power doctrines that did specifically limit the state legislatures themselves. These were in two areas where state power came into potential conflict with federal power. This was the Commerce, Negative Commerce Clause Doctrine, and the Contracts Clause Doctrine. So in the, the court never really decided whether the Commerce Clause was exclusive early on, but it did seem to assume that it was. And it said, but that's okay, because the states have this independent power, this police power, and so long as it's exercising legitimately its police power uh, for the police power purposes, we're gonna call what they're doing a regulation of police rather than an impermissible permissible regulation of commerce, even if this regulation of police affects or touches the exact same subjects uh, uh, that the co commerce power can. Um, I don't have so much time, uh, so I'll just say Gibbons v. Ogden, Wilson v. Blackbird, uh, Creek Marsh, New York v. Milne, license cases, passenger cases, all support uh, this reading, this police power limitations. Uh, and uh, but again, it was it was it was a doctrine that was an accommodation uh, for state power where it might otherwise implicate federal power or come into conflict with federal power. The other example is the contracts cases. A prominent case cited for the substantive due process thesis is a case out of Vermont, a railroad case called Thorpe, where they basically said, well, yes, the states can't impair the obligations of contracts, including existing corporate contracts. The issue there was whether the state could require railroads, existing railroad corporations, to um, create cattle guards, build cattle guards, otherwise they would be subject to damages. And the court basically said, well, uh, uh, as long as the legislature is in making this law for a genuine police power purpose, it's not an impairment of a contractual obligation. Uh, and so uh, none of these doctrines uh, supported a general limitation on state power where there wasn't a potential conflict with federal power and when it wasn't a municipal uh, corporation. So what happened? Where did we get substantive due process from? Okay, we got the 14th Amendment, and then we have Slaughterhouse, and we're gonna put Slaughterhouse aside for a second, because that was mostly privileges or immunities clause, and so I think it might actually work in that context. But after uh, Slaughterhouse basically wrote out the privileges or immunities clause, uh, I submit, if you look at uh, the Barbier case, uh, Mugler, Lochner, under the guise of due process of law, the court cited municipal corporations cases, contracts cases, and negative commerce clause cases for the proposition that states were generally limited by the police power. However, a close examination of these antebellum cases suggests that none of these three doctrines actually supported uh, that principle, uh, that holding. Having said that, uh, a police powers doctrine might work as a limitation against the states in the context of the privileges or immunities clause. Uh, why? Uh, this is the most tentative part of my paper, but it would be an analogy to the contract and negative commerce uh, jurisprudence. Basically, just like the states couldn't impair obligations of contract, but they could exercise police powers, and then they that wouldn't legitimate if they legitimately did so, it wouldn't be considered an impairment of contract. Well, the police powers could be a defense to an abridgment. Uh, so if someone brings a claim that you are abridging the privileges or immunities of citizenship, a state could potentially defend by saying, well, no, we're not abridging. This is a legitimate exercise of the police power. Now, this would go both ways. An illegitimate exercise of the police power would militate potentially uh, in favor of finding um, an abridgment. Now, this works whether one adopts the fundamental rights reading of the privileges or immunities clause or the equality reading. Uh, in either case, I think the police powers, uh, a legitimate exercise could be a defense to a finding of abridgment and an improper exercise would militate in favor of finding uh, uh, an abridgment. I think I might have said it backward the other way, but you get the point. I don't know if the police powers doctrine is does all of the work uh, in the privileges or immunities context, but it could be relevant there. And I submit that that's where substantive due process advocates, certainly police power, uh, limitations advocates should focus their energies, I guess, in, in the coming years. That's what I'm, what I think I'm, well, that's what I'm trying to show. I think I've shown it, but that's certainly what I'm trying to show. Thank you. Very good. So how long should I speak? Um, until I tell you to stop. Uh, <laughs> I would like to apportion equally amongst you. The get, you get, you get 18 minutes. According uh, to if the I program. could use less, I will do less. If I could use more, I won't take it. Um, it, it's a very great pleasure to be here and to comment upon these papers. Uh, Vince asked me the question, is there any magic theme that links them all together? And I think with respect to the first three papers, the answer is probably no, although actually 
across panels, particularly uh, when we get to dealing with public lands and things like that, there actually are some very close parallels that exist. So let me take the papers in early and, and indicate one of the themes that does relate to all of them, which I think is extremely important. Uh, what happens is, if you look at this paper, uh, what you do is you see that he's basically, I think Paul quite rightly, identifies an elephant in a room, uh, which is when we start to look at, at the criminal law, the traditional view that we had of the subject was that you were punished by the criminal law and that your sanction would be to some extent proportional to the wrong that you committed. Uh, we do have learned discussions as to whether or not we have this as a deterrent theory or a retribution theory. I regard that as largely a debate which is beside the point. If the only cases that seem to indicate the difference between them are the Kantian cases where we have to punish people when the end of the world is on nigh and we do it as a retributivist but not as a deterrent guy, I'm willing to concede him what's going to happen if the world goes into the sun. Uh, but for most cases, it turns out that the parallelisms are particularly close, uh, that the differences in the theory really don't matter. What really does matter is, however, is under both of these theories, if they have an implicit test of proportionality, and you know that there is some kind of collateral consequences that may or necessarily will follow from what's going on, it becomes very difficult when you're trying to think about this thing from the ex-ante perspective uh, to ignore those particular kinds of consequences when you're trying to evaluate the decisions are going. What Paul does in this particular paper is he does, I think, quite sensibly, tries to cash out the difference that you have by seeking essentially uh, not to monetize because the term of years is not monetized, but to essentially temporalize and to figure out this particular cattle consequence is going to be worth so many years. And so when you're trying to figure out the kinds of protections, if on the basis of the formal punishments you're a three-month guy with relatively limited protection and you look at the collateral consequences and you're a nine-month guy, uh, then that's going to change the nature of the protection that is going to be given. Well, one of the implicit problems that you have in the ex post world is if it turns out that there are high variances with the respect in which the second system is going to be applied, it's going to feed itself back into the first system. So you don't know whether you're supposed to be adding six months, three months, 12 months, or whatever. And it becomes extremely difficult to work these things out. Um, not because it's the wrong approach, but because it turns out even though you could try and essentially temporalize all of these elements, you cannot do so in a way which is more accurate than the way in which the positions work. And this residual level of uncertainty that you're going to have to face is going to feed itself back into the earlier decision. Well, earlier decisions by whom one happens. And one of the things that happens is uh, there are two kinds of earlier decisions. One of them is, of course, by the individuals who are likely to be subject to some of these collateral consequences. I think the most painful case for trying to deal with this is, in effect, the situation with respect to immigrants um, or students um, who are there. I recently uh, worked on a case in, in which what happened is some student at some nameless university got in contact with me uh, because it was a foreign student and there was a sexual harassment charge brought against him uh, which called for dismissal uh, from the university of suspension. Uh, if it had been an American student, you would have stewed your juices and so forth. But if you're a foreign student, uh, one of the consequences is that deportation within a certain period of time uh, now becomes one of the collateral consequences that arises out of this. And so what happens is should this be fed back into the system in the way in which you start to administer the practice, both by the administrators on the one hand, and also uh, when you're trying to figure out how you conduct your own life, uh, do you essentially recognize that you're under a heavy burden? I think for the latter question, the answer is always yes. And my sense of having spoken to a number of people who've worked through these systems is that it, it turns out the collateral consequences are uppermost in everybody's mind, um, and it does change primary conduct. It leads to a real sort of unequal protection of the law. If one guy is going to face the sword of Damocles, then the other guy is going to face the standard punishment. So what can then happen under these circumstances that you don't talk about, but I think it's a fair question. Is there anything that the prosecutors can do in order to deal with the case uh, so that the collateral consequences can be eliminated? Because what they're doing is they're saying, look, I really want to punish this guy a billion dollars, but I don't want to punish this guy a billion dollars and take away his license. And the guy in this particular case, and the one that actually happened, was, of course, J.P. Morgan Chase. And you, know, you want to go after them in order because you think they've been involved in the Manhoff, the matter of struggle or something or other else, and you realize at the moment you file a prosecution, forget about conviction, right? 
That's a pause. Well, all the licenses are going to be pulled, and so you have this hundred and you know the two trillion dollar operation, which is going to be shut down because of a uh, an alleged violation on the part of somebody. Uh, so what they did essentially is they didn't say, "I'm not going to file this." They go to the director of the controller in New York State, a guy named Lawsky, and they say, "Look, do you agree to suspend the enforcement of the law at your end so that I could prosecute him at my end?" To which the answer was, "Amen, brother." And what you therefore do is you now have a serious problem about kinds of collusion that are taking place between government agencies at different levels and in different parties, uh, because they may say amen brother in some cases and not say it in the other cases. And when they don't say yes, it could be for one or two reasons. One is they want it to be prosecuted so they can get them out of the business, or they can say we don't want it to be prosecuted, and so long as we keep the nuclear option table on the table, uh, what's going to happen is that we're going to change the primary conduct. So one of the things I think that Paul should do, since he's worked on this since his time as a Bigelow Fellow at the University of Chicago, is spend more time investigating the ex-ante operation of the Sword of Damocles in the way in which it starts to work with these things, with uh, deferred prosecution agreements and a bunch of other stuff. And I think you'll discover that it is extremely difficult to come up with a good set of rules. So you know, I think it's a, a noble effort uh, but this is the same problem that exists in every case, too little, too late. I mean, it turns out you just can't really run these things the way we would like to uh, when we have this sort of wildly over-regulatory system, and this is very nice illustration of how difficult it is. Uh, now, every time I, I think of Jennifer, she ruins my travel experiences. Mm -hmm. And now, why do I say that? Well, I was going through the uh, check situation, and I presented my ticket and my license, and I noticed that I protect, presented them to an officer of the United States who is basically working behind the counter at the TSA stand. Um, now, the question is, and I think this is the problem that exists for her first paper, and I think it's also a problem that exists with respect to the, the second paper, is do we want to use a definition in which essentially we attach constitutional consequences uh, that you have to be appointed by either the president or one of these three preferred bodies uh, every time there's an officer title in the definition. And if you go back to a Stanford taper, you know, I assume that this woman who took my passage, she could look at me cross-eyed and say, you know, I really don't kind of trust you, young man. Uh, I like the title. Um, what I'm going to do is I, I'm referring you over to this guy, and he's going to stop and frisk you and look through your baggage and everything else uh, to see whether or not you're carrying contraband or some kind of illegal substance. And I think she has that kind of authority. I think at some point that makes her count as an officer, uh, much the way a police officer and an ordinary police officer would do that. And yet I cannot conceive of a legal system in which it turns out that people like this are going to be, have to be hired by uh, the president, the head of a department, or something of the sort. It, it just simply cannot work in, in that particular fashion. So the real question that one has to deal with is a very complicated uh, sort of originalist challenge for which I don't think the ratification debates are going to answer the central question, um, which is you have this term officer, and do you essentially say that the moment you designate somebody as an officer for the purposes of enforcement, which is what they're trying to do given the arrest right, you have now designated them as an officer for the purposes of the appointments clause. Now, the first thing that one says is every time you hear the phrase uh, for the purposes of clause X as opposed to the purposes of clause Y, the first thing you want to do is put your hand on your wallet and say, well, if I get to pick my purpose, I will choose my purpose when I taught jurisprudence back at the University of Southern California early on. One of my smart students named Don Browns, I still remember his name, he said to me, when I do purposes analysis, is I pick my purpose to suit my purpose. And that, of course, <laughs> it's a very clever phrase, which means that this is the source of immense potential of abuse, if, in fact, it turns out that it's an opportunistic <laughs> device. Uh, but the counter response that you have to give to this particular theorem is if you don't do something of this particular sort, you end up with some kind of a constitutional absurdity in trying to work at these things. Now, part of the problem is, in fact, that the two definitions simply do not cohere. And you therefore have to ask the question as to whether common usages in some point actually carry over to another related to the problem. 
And I think that everybody agrees that to the extent that accountability and transparency are issues with respect to the appointments clause, that has to do with maybe the three or four people who are running the department who set policy, but it's not talking about people who have discretion in individual cases. And of course, we do know that discretion is defined very broadly with respect to the discretionary function exception with respect to the Federal Torts Claims Act, but we, we don't want these people in. And so then the question is, how do we manage to define it in a way to get it out? And they use the term, which, which Jennifer in other cases has criticized about sufficient functions at the kind of highest level. And I think that the, she's right to be uneasy about it, but the question is, can you beat something with nothing? And then what's that other thing going to be, uh, which is going to be a better definition under these terms? Uh, the ratification debates, I don't think can solve this problem. I think it's a serious conceptual problem that you have to face. And it has uh, two other dimensions that I want to talk about briefly. One of them is, uh, I think, an extremely important problem known as the scale effect. Uh, you was talking about a very small government, very few layers and so forth. You could imagine a system in which a very large percentage of the employees of the United States government may be appointed by the heads of department. Uh, you scale up the government by a thousandfold, and nothing like that will start to work. And so then they always, the question is, with respect to structural protection, as the structures become more complicated, do you essentially have to dumb down and delegate down? Uh, so virtually all of the people who we call offices when we look at their lapels are in fact people who we call employees under the current doctrine, and we're probably right in making that kind of distinction. And so I would want to know from her in her third paper on this issue as to exactly which way she comes out on how much the so-called originalist stuff helps. The second problem which she points out, I think, is an extremely important one, systematically under-theorized, which is about the question of federal-state cooperation in these particular issues. And why is this such a very, very difficult problem that we're trying to deal with is that you just have to start and look at Article Three, And they have the Great Compromise, which is the only federal court that's guaranteed is, of course, uh, the United States Supreme Court. All the other lower courts, such as Congress shall ordain and establish, and as best I can tell, John, correct me if I'm wrong, there is no duty on the part of the federal government to create a lower court system. Uh, is, that, is that right? All right, well, now you don't create it. Or we have another Trump reform. Uh, what we do is we just abolish all federal lower courts. Well, at this particular point, everything has to be federal state cooperation because the only place in which you can sue anybody with respect to anything will be in some side of a state court. And so you have to recognize, at least for some portion of the game, this sort of cooperation exists. And there are a bunch of cases where, for example, if you bring an FELA case in a state court, there's the question of do you use federal rules of procedure or state rules of procedure to answer it. This is a, a real interaction. Well, if you think about administration and have the same view, the federal administration is relatively scant and you haven't been able to fill it out, you get exactly the same problem. And I think she's exactly right when she says this sort of puts the commandeering jurisdiction somewhat at odds with the way in which it was historically understood, and it's, it tends to support the dissenting positions in Prince, I think that's what you would say, rather than the majority opinion. And I think, in effect, that that's probably right. The difference, though, that doesn't solve it is did you do this by way of voluntary cooperation or did you do it by way of command? That's also tricky. And one other point about this is when Will Bode's first paper on the takings clause came out, essentially he said that the federal government would never command, let, condemn land inside the states. It was always done uh, by the states uh, in a combination with the federal government. So I think one of the larger problems here is less the textual one and more the problem about sort of cooperation and accommodation between federal and state governments across this wide range of areas. Okay, now the third paper I guess is Elon, right? And you know, let me say, I, I, I agree and disagree with the paper, uh, but one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm gonna comment on a statement that started in the middle of your presentation and it was with the sense, so I'm gonna put the privileges or immunities clause uh, to one side, and my immediate response to that is uh, the same response that happened after the incident at the Ford Theater. Uh, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, uh, how did you enjoy the play? Um, I don't think you can do this, because what's happening American constitutionally is, as I think Alan rightly understands, it <coughs> is very congenial to figure out how it is that you fit uh, the uh, police power of a traditional sense into uh, the privileges and immunities cases. 
And indeed, uh, some people like Herb Hobenkamp, when they start to interpret the actual particular case, there's a big debate, implicit uh, in his view, between whether or not the slaughterhouse was exclusivity and it was the owners of the place who could determine who stayed in and who went out, at which point what you do is you have the dreaded creation of state monopolies, and state monopolies are the sorts of things which in the antebellum period, right, were subject to, oh, no, 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 you cannot do it, or whether, in effect, what happens is that these facilities were sufficiently large and that you had to treat them, now that they have monopoly powers, as a common carrier of sorts, subject to the standard obligations to take people in, subject to fair and reasonable regulations that were non-discriminatory towards the various parties. And what happened is the whole thing got short-circuited because you never have to deal with the justifications under these things if it turns out that there's no initial coverage to begin with. And so uh, Ilan rightly mentioned that there were two views that were disputed about the thing. Is this a non-discrimination provision um, on various people in and out? Or is it a fundamental rights protection? It reads like one, and the legislative history tends to read like the other. But no matter which side of that debate you're on, the one opinion which is clearly wrong is that of Justice Miller in the slaughterhouse cases, uh, where he says, in effect, this applies to navigable rivers and the right to petition the federal government. And I think everybody who read that opinion who was involved in the original debate had their jaws dropped. And the reason he did this was the perpetual censor line that he put in there. He could not conceive, I can conceive of this, um, that you would have the federal government basically having a check and balance override over the states, a kind of a judicial version of a Madisonian vehicle, as it were. And indeed, that was many of the reasons why they did privileges and immunities. They thought that the state protection of individual rights under their own regimes was insufficient. You couldn't federalize it all through the contracts clause. We wanted a much more robust way in which to go in there. And so that what happens is immediately all this stuff then migrates to the other two clauses that are still left standing after Slaughterhound. Uh, there's a huge difference in that they both apply to persons, not just to citizens. But in many of the key statements about them, the word person is now substituted in for citizen back again so as to make it like that. And you start talking about the police power. And so what's the way in which I disagree with Leon is this. And I don't know, I think it's closer to Randy's view, but I'm, I'm not even sure. It's closer to my view. My view is closer to my view than, than to anybody else's, I, I think I can say. Is if you start looking at what the substantive content of uh, the police power is in all the antebellum states, it's essentially always a combination and an amalgam of two separate themes. Uh, one of them is this is ultra virus, what it is that you're entitled to do. And indeed, even in the post case on the, on the standing issue, any member of a municipality could sue to enjoin activities which were ultra virus the power of the organization. And one of the most dreadful features of Frothingham and Mellon in the opinion that was written by Sutherland is he tried to distinguish those cases on the ground that somehow or other ultra virus is okay for municipal governments but not for the federal constitution based upon the different size, a totally irrelevant constitution, uh, constitutional principle here. And so you can challenge it that way. And then the other thing was, of course, the other view of this was, well, yes, it's within your power, uh, but we have to check the purpose and motive of what's going on. And this is a theme which runs through every single area of war, whether it's domestic, whether it's international, whatever. This is legitimate if it turns out that you've got yourself a health and safety motivation. I'll put aside for the moment morals and general welfare. If you got one of those things, then presumptively it's okay because the safety of the public is the highest duty of any particular government to provide. So we could stop nuisances like that. On the other hand, in the pure type on the opposite side, if all you're trying to do is to create some anti-competitive situation where you give a franchise to one guy and deny it to his particular competitor and get a payoff from the government for giving it, um, this is just a total improper use. It's a kind of a diversion of public trust assets and powers to one party. And no government fiduciary is entitled to essentially take powerful things for the benefit of the public and give it on a surprise basis uh, to certain kinds of individuals. And so you would join it. And if you looked at the earlier categories, that's exactly what they were after in all of these particular cases. So I don't think it's a particular uh, enormous change given the, the substantive arrangement there. What really happened is the due process clause, it becomes substantive due process because we killed essentially privileges and immunities. And then once we decided that it's substantive due process, um, 
i.e. privileges and immunities, all the police power issues start to come back. And the reason why it's different is, sure, the state legislatures were plenary with respect to the federal government in the antebellum period, but they're not plenary with respect to the federal government after you throw in the 14th Amendment and its various clauses. So once you put that particular kind of an arrangement in, what they did is it's a kind of a, a, a transplant, a, a migration. You've already had all of the basic notions of what was needed in order to have an effective police power doctrine in place. And then what you did is you say, now that we have a constitutional approach to which we do it, we simply take the old learning over and bring it to the new area, and we don't miss a beat. I don't think there's anything particularly illegitimate about that type situation. Uh, the difficulty always comes with the noted oxymoron, substantive due process. And the reason why most of us are upset about that is we know how it comes, and therefore we're very uneasy about the way in which this thing evolved. Uh, but one of the great themes of American constitutional law is the theme, what do we do when constitutional blunders have essentially uh, taken over? Uh, do you correct them? Do you ignore them or whatever? Uh, and if we remember the luncheon debate, we did not have a really strong theory of what we do with qualified immunity if we think it's a mistake and how we correct it. Uh, this is exactly the same kind of debate. And the last point for 10 seconds only is I think it's also a big mistake to tie too closely the police power to the due process clause. If you just look at the federal government, Reynolds against the United States is a classic illustration of a police power limitations being applied directly to a constitutional guarantee in what I thought was a completely atrocious way. But police powers apply not only to due process, they apply to every single substantive clause because it's always the same point. Or we give individuals certain kinds of rights, but we're not going to allow them to use those rights to inflict harm upon others or to create various kinds of, 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 of monopolies. So what we do is we first have a police power doctrine which limits what the government can do, and then we use the same doctrine of the police power to limit what private individuals can do as well. Okay. Done. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. All right. Wonderful. So <coughs> we're now uh, Vince. Okay, uh, let me see if I can follow Richard. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for being here despite the siren song of a post-lunch nap. Uh, and thanks especially to Richard for engaging with these papers. One of the great thrills of my time as a law student was studying antitrust with Richard, uh, even if he's fond of reminding me that I was emphatically not his best student. Um, In a very strong way. <laughs> but like everyone here, I've been learning from Richard ever since, uh, so, so thank you. Um, changing gears here to municipal bankruptcy law. Uh, so the paper I'm going to talk about is forthcoming in the University of Chicago Law Review. If it's interesting to you, I'll email you a copy or you can find it on, on SSRN. Okay, the object of this paper is to give an account of what a municipal bankruptcy law uh, might be good for, and then on that basis, assess the law we actually have, chapter nine of the bankruptcy uh, code, and think about how it might be uh, improved. So the motivation is pretty straightforward. We've seen in the last decade, the first and largest municipal bankruptcies of general purpose municipalities, cities, counties, towns, that we've had since the law was first enacted in the 19. 30s, and these cases, especially cases like Detroit and the similar, although not quite bankruptcy of Puerto Rico, are attracting a lot of scholarly attention, among other things. But the literature so far has lacked a kind of comprehensive account of what, what it is that the law might be trying to do, what we might be trying to do with the law, I guess you better said. So my aims are practical as well as theoretical. I'm trying to just improve people's understanding of what's going on in the structure of the law. And also, to the extent I can, I want to help channel uh, uh, impulses for reform d down avenues that make, make some sense. So a high-level summary of my conclusions, the general kind of normative claim is that bankruptcy can, law can do really just one thing in the municipal context. Um, it can preserve spatial economies, technical term, but which means basically the things that are advantageous about a special, a particular place. It can preserve those economies uh, that are associated with a municipality's 
unique geographical territory where large stocks of public debt would otherwise threaten to erode those economies and cause the most the people and capital most product most sensitive to productivity to leave. Um, okay, I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that in a second. Unfortunately, the second part of my claim is that Chapter 9, as currently operating today, is very poorly calibrated to realize that end and is more or less useless in its current incarnation. Okay, so the upshot of my analysis is sort of mixed. Um, I'm more pessimistic than boosters are about the range of cases in which a bankruptcy law might actually be useful. So part of my goal in the paper is to dump cold water on uh, kumbaya types. Uh, on the other hand, I'm optimistic about the possibility for increasing the scope of the bankruptcy law in any particular case, namely in, in cases where it might actually do some good. I think we could we could uh, improve the law. Okay, so my way into the paper is to to translate the leading kind of contractarian uh, model for thinking about corporate bankruptcy law, often known as the creditor's bargain model, uh, onto the municipal context. Now the core distinction at play in the corporate cases is between two kinds of companies with unsustainable debt stocks. One kind has a viable business model, so its assets are capable of producing revenue sufficient to cover ongoing costs, it just happens to have a large and, uh, debt stock that it can't handle. So the parad paradigmatic example of this kind of company is the, the railroads of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. You know, no one thought it made sense for creditors to you know, levy on little bits of steel or sell wooden ties as a kindling. And a bankruptcy law can help in that kind of setting. So financial distress gives rise to some distinctive holdout incentives among co-investors. And it can make sense to have a judicially mediated procedure to help unwind some of those incentives. The idea is to preserve the, uh, the value of the company's assets by keeping them together. Okay, the other kind of company lacks a viable business model. However sound its business might have been at some time, it can no longer generate revenues sufficient to cover ongoing costs. So an example I give in the paper is like Smith Corona, the typewriter manufacturer. Right? The PC revolution means there's no saving that that, that business. Bankruptcy can't do anything for that kind of company. It can delay the inevitable by forcing creditors to subsidize sort of ongoing operations for a little while, but fundamentally it can't do anything. Okay, so my take in this paper is really pretty simple. It's just to take seriously the idea that a municipality is a kind of firm. It has a business model in a very real sense. So it has costs. It's the cost of maintaining roads and providing drinking water, supplying social regulation, and so on. And it has revenues, uh, what it takes in from taxes and user fees, in addition to reliable grants and aid. And over time, the revenues, revenues need to cover costs. So what's unusual about the municipality is only that it doesn't, for the most part, own the assets that generate its revenues. So a municipality's ability to raise revenues depends on the desire of people and businesses to locate themselves in the unique territory that defines the municipality rather than elsewhere. So the reasons that people and businesses have to do so, the advantages of being local, so to speak, um, are the municipality's spatial economies. And like any capital asset, a place's spatial economies require investment both to create, to sustain, and, and to exploit. Okay, so once you see things this way, it becomes obvious that a municipality can fail for a variety of reasons just like a for-profit company can. One reason is an excessive stock of debt, which I'll come back to in a minute, but much more common, municipal decay has nothing to do with finance. And like with Smith Corona, Changes to the technological environment can cr create a negative shock on the, on the value of the assets, in this case, the spatial economies of the place. So for example, when we get mechani increasing mechanization of agriculture, interstate freeways, reliable automobiles over the course of the second half of the 20th century, people naturally started to find it much less useful to locate themselves along the highways and the byways. Um, and if you 
like me have a two-year-old kid, you know that the plot of Pixar's Cars movie is about uh, exactly uh, this, this phenomenon. So unsustainable debt in these cases is often a byproduct, but it's not the cause of dysfunction. There are a lot of these cases, and I think there are a real social concern. Um, but one of the points, and I guess a big part of the paper, is just to show that bankruptcy law is not, uh, is not an answer to that kind of problem. So what bankruptcy can do is to help stop excessive debt loads from causing the people and businesses to flee a jurisdiction. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, oh, this the right phrase, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, I won't elaborate on how debt can do that. You can probably do the math. The basic idea is that a large stock of, of public debt can discourage new investment in spatial economies. And over time, that decreases the productivity of being in a place and the people and firms most sensitive to that productivity leave and are replaced by people less sensitive to productivity, you get a kind of vicious cycle. So if the law intervenes early enough with debt relief, it can unwind that kind of vicious cycle. Okay, the punchline about chapter nine is that it's terrible at doing that. For a lot of reasons I talk about in the paper and in some other work I have, um, the law makes it very hard to intervene with debt relief in the time frame that you'd actually need to prevent one of these vicious cycles from developing. So I give some ideas in the paper that are probably of not of any interest to generalists as in this room, but uh, if you're interested in them, we can uh, talk later. Thanks. Okay, so um, Lance. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lance Sorensen, uh, my paper's on public lands management. I'm going to start with a story, and your job is to guess what year this takes place. An outgoing president in the last few days of his term uses delegated power from Congress to designate millions of acres of the American West as reserves, rendering them largely off limits to mining, grazing, and timber removal. Elected officials from Western states howled in opposition and accused the president of being out of touch. To them, the president had violated a core notion of federalism that land use uh, decisions ought to be made locally by the people who know the land the best. One livestock owner achieved national fame or infamy by continuing to graze his livestock on prohibited public lands. To the relief of many Westerners, the incoming president promised to rescind his predecessor's action or at least reduce the size of the reserves. However, the legal question that came to dominate the landscape, so to speak, was does the president have the power to rescind a prior president's proclamation? If, have you guessed the year? I don't have an award, but pat yourself on the back. I read the paper. <laughs> if uh, you, you said 1897, the outgoing president was Grover Cleveland. Uh, the incoming president was William McKinley. Uh, and in a bid to win support in the West for a war with Spain, he promised to revoke Cleveland's proclamation of millions of forest reserves. The livestock owner, by the way, was Pierre Grimaud, uh, sort of the predecessor to Clive and Bundy. Uh, if you did not guess 1897, you still get partial credit because most of these facts apply to a number of time periods since then. For example, you might have said 1943, when Hollywood actor Wallace Beery led 550 sheep and their shepherds into the newly created Grand Teton National Monument to protest its creation by Franklin Roosevelt. Or you might have said 1978, when President Carter created national monuments in Alaska, totaling more than 56 million acres. Or you might have said 1996, when President Clinton created the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in an announcement that caught local leaders by surprise. Or you might have said 2016-2017 period, when outgoing President Obama created the Bears Ears National Monument and incoming President Trump uh, issued a proclamation reducing the size of the monument and the Grand Staircase Monument. Uh, these last actions all taking place against the backdrop of prominent Western rancher and his family continuing to graze livestock on public lands without a permit and even occupying federal land in Oregon. Uh, I feel like when I travel east of the Mississippi, and I think we are east unless I got myself turned around, that I have to justify and explain. South of the Mississippi. South of the Mississippi. Are we yeah. south? Well, One okay. If we were across the river, though, you might understand what I'm talking about. But over here, you might uh, need an explanation of uh, the controversy that surrounds land issues in the West. The day after President Trump issued his proclamation reducing the size of Bears Ears, several lawsuits were filed against him. Uh, 
alleging that he violated the statute uh, by which Congress gave the president power to create monuments in the first place, which is the Antiquities Act, which grants the president power to, quote, declare by public proclamation historic landmarks and may reserve as part thereof parcels of land, the limits of which shall be confined to the smallest area compatible with proper care and management. The issue in the cases against Trump is whether he acted within the confines of the statute. Both the critics of Trump's action and his defenders treat the Antiquities Act as a delegation of Congress's legislative power. However, this paper asks us to step back and examine the property clause power itself. This paper makes two related assertions. First, uh, that the property clause power housed in Congress is not strictly a legislative power, but it is also administrative in nature. And second, that this has implications for judicial review of presidential decisions made uh, pursuant to a delegated uh, power under the property clause. So the argument that the property clause uh, power is administrative is based on history, structure, and legal precedent. First, the history, or some of it, uh, under the British system and prior to the revolution, the king uh, had near total power to manage crown lands. Managing the national domain, domain then was uh, handed, handled by the executive, not by parliament. American founders such as St. George Tucker pointed out the dangers of allowing the king or executive to manage the national domain. By selling off land, the king or executive would be able to raise revenue without Congress or parliament and the strings that come attached with that money. Lots of money in the hands of, a, of an executive often in their experience led to starting wars. This was concerning to the Constitutional Convention, still wary of reverting to a British-like king. For this reason, the framers placed the power to manage property with Congress and not with the president. However, if we go to look for the property clause power in Article I, where we usually go to find congressional powers, we won't find it there. Rather, it is in Article IV. Uh, so why? Why not Article 1? Uh, let me suggest two reasons, and this brings me to the structural piece of the paper. Uh, first, a review of the convention's history reveals that the management of the national domain was inextricably tied, at least in their minds, to the creation and admission of new states. The majority of the founders did not envision a vast permanent national domain. Rather, they envisioned the creation of new states out of the national domain. Article 4 deals primarily with relationships of states with each other and with the federal government, so it was a natural place to put the admission and property clauses. The second reason is that Congress recognized that the buying, selling, leasing, and managing of the national do domain was administrative in nature, not legislative. Um, and there has been a temptation to uh, revert to a king-like system, and I think that's partially because Congress has recognized the difficulties of housing and administrative power in a branch of government that's not really set up to do administrative thing, uh, things. This distinction between legislative and administrative power has been recognized by courts in the past, uh, which brings me to the legal precedent section of the argument. I don't have time to go through all of the cases, but one example I think might be helpful from a case decided one year before Congress passed the Antiquities Act. In Butte City Water uh, versus Baker, the court was asked to decide whether Congress had violated the non-delegation doctrine by deferring some mining disputes on public land to local miners' codes. So these were laws created by miners. Uh, the court said there was no violation of the non-delegation doctrine and it hinged its ruling on its characterization of the property clause. Uh, it said the property clause is not of a legislative character in its highest sense of the term. Uh, rather, legislation passed pursuant thereto, thereto savors uh, somewhat of mere rules prescribed, prescribed by an owner of property. Okay, so if we were to accept that the property clause is hybrid in nature, containing administrative elements, uh, then what are the implications for ju judicial review? So this brings me to the second claim of the paper. The concerns that animate the delegation of legislative powers, that is the ensuring of a separation of powers so that ambition can be made to counteract ambition, are not present when Congress enlists the aid of the president to manage public lands. The courts, therefore, should take a deferential approach to public lands management. As the Supreme Court said in a case called Light v. United States, it is not for courts to say how public lands should be administered. These are rights incident to proprietorship. Courts should not second guess the management of the nation's proper property. Uh, 
What to do then in a case like Bears Ears, in which the allegation is that the president has gone outside the statutory delegation of power from Congress? Courts should let Congress guard its own authority and allow them to rein in presidents it thinks have gone too far. Is Congress capable of doing this? Without making any claims about the outgoing Congress or the new Congress, Congress has many times in the past limited presidential power with respect to the Antiquities Act and other delegations of property power. In both 1950 and 1979, for example, Congress stepped in to limit presidential power under the Antiquities Act in Wyoming and Alaska. And the Alaska legislation, I think, is a good model of what Congress might do with the Antiquity, Antiquities Act nationwide. What it does is it allows the president to step in and declare a monument uh, to protect it from imminent harm, but it creates a fuse on it and gives con Congress the final word on whether there should be permanent protections put in place. If President Trump has gone outside the scope of the Antiquities Act, the institution that should rein him in is Congress and not the judiciary. Thank you. So, last time we left. I'm used to that. <laughs> well, thank you again. Um, thank you, Richard, for commenting. Thank you to all of you for sticking around um, to the very end um, to hear about Frankfurter, abstention doctrine, and the development of modern federalism. I'm Lyle Weinberger. Um, I'm currently clerking on the Seventh Circuit. And looking at Frankfurter, um, we can find uh, something surprising. In its first century and a half, the Supreme Court never used the term federalism in an opinion. The very first use of federalism by the US Supreme Court was in a 1939 decision by Justice Frankfurter. Labeling a concept is a clue to a historian that something new is probably happening with this concept. What was new in 1939? The short answer, Frankfurter. He had been on the court for exactly one month when he introduced federalism to the Supreme Court's vocabulary. Before long, he coupled federalism with older equitable doctrines to create abstention doctrine, requiring federal courts to abstain from hearing cases that were within their jurisdiction. The abstention cases and their concept of federalism were rooted in Frankfurter's progressive politics. They were a reaction to what he perceived to be federal courts tendencies to favor conservative, anti-regulatory, and anti-labor attitudes. The history of Justice Frankfurter and abstention is relevant again today, particularly as the political discussion around the courts is once again echoing the progressive era. A look at the history sets the stage for considering the future of abstention. And I want to suggest three possibilities. One is maintaining the current status quo on the Supreme Court and its current treatment of abstention. Another would be a liberal backtracking from abstention. And a third would be a convergence of progressives and judicial restrained conservatives to embrace a more <laughs> robust view of abstention that Frankfurter would have approved of. First, a quick look at some history. Barely a month after Frankfurter joined the court, he authored the opinion and Hale v. Bimco Trading Company on the Anti-Injunction Act, which prohibited federal courts from issuing injunctions to stay, pro stay proceedings in a state court. Frankfurter described it as a mechanism for achieving harmony in our complicated federalism, avoiding friction between two systems of courts having potential jurisdiction over the same subject matter. The reference to our federalism was the first ever use of federalism in a Supreme Court opinion. The court had, of course, considered the relationship of state and federal courts before without the term, but Frankfurter's uh, terminological innovation uh, foreshadowed his soon coming doctrinal innovation, which was abstention doctrine. His 1941 opinion in Pullman established the principle that federal courts should abstain from deciding a constitutional issue to th that involved an unsettled issue of state law when abstaining and allowing a state court to resolve that state issue might remove the necessity of the federal courts deciding a federal constitutional question. The context was the Texas Railroad Commission having issued a requirement that all railroads with sleeper cars employ white conductors. There was a statutory argument that the commission had overstepped its authority under Texas law. And of course, there was a constitutional argument that the blatantly racist Railroad Commission order violated the Equal Protection Clause. Frankfurter's opinion for the court required abstention by invoking federalism 
and incorporating federalism into the equity calculus. Let the state courts resolve this matter. Frankfurter later, later doubled down on the federalism rationale in Louisiana Power and Light versus Thibodeau. He asserted that abstention was not merely a technical rule of equity procedure. He said it, it reflected a deeper policy derived from our federalism. Frankfurter's thought about federalism and abstention developed before he came to the court. As a young lawyer, he came of age in the progressive era debating the issue of courts in the American system of government. Progressives widely believed that courts were overwhelmingly conservative. They were especially troubled by the freedom of contract line of cases, strictly scrutinizing state regulatory law, and by the aggressive use of injunctions to regulate labor and labor protests. A recent scholarship has called into question the idea that the federal courts were as conservative uh, as the progressives made them out to be, but the progressives' perception was very real in their own minds. Frankfurter was a committed progressive who supported not just, just judicial restraint, but efforts to modify and reduce federal court jurisdiction in the 1920s and 30s. But was there any reason that a progressive like Frankfurter might see a significant difference between state and federal courts when it came to these issues that progressives cared about most? And indeed, there was. State courts were, above all, more democratically responsive, more susceptible to political pressure. State courts, of course, were often elected. Um, and state constitutions were easier to change, and it was easier to experiment with different methods of putting additional democratic accountability mechanisms on the courts. Progressives uh, discussed and experimented with abolishing judicial review, requiring unanimous or supermajority votes of judges to strike down legislative enactments. And they instituted recall provisions um, to recall judges and to recall judicial decisions via uh, democratic votes. Frankfurter's scholarly writings about the federal courts often hid his politics behind an apparently politically neutral concern about overworked courts and overburdened dockets. But the politics still lurked in the background, and perhaps the most obvious example of this was in the abstention context. In 1910, the House of Representatives considered legislation that would let the state courts construe their own statutes before federal courts construed them. It was a foreshadowing of what would later come in Pullman. It didn't pass, and it immediately fell into obscurity, except that Frankfurter had paid attention, and he wrote about it some 16 years later. And then 30 years later, basically put this failed congressional proposal um, into the heart of his Pullman opinion. This dramatically illustrates the close tie between abstention and progressive politics. In Frankfurter's hands, federalism provided a rationale to restrain the jurisdiction of the federal courts, to sh shift, at least at the margin, more authority towards a more democratically accountable institution, the state judiciary. Looking back at this history can provide a jumping off point for thinking about three possible futures for federal, federalism-based abstention in our own day. One is basically a status quo future. The current Supreme Court, um, more sensitive to some originalist concerns, has backed off from what we might see as Frankfurter's broadest inclinations to view federalism as a freestanding uh, basis for abstention, and has emphasized a law equity distinction where, um, as it suggested in Quackenbush, abstention is appropriate in equitable cases where the courts have discretion, um, but should be avoided in cases at law. The Supreme Court could continue on this course um, a modest status quo version of abstention. Um, but there are a couple other options. One would be a sharp cutback of abstention, um, which we might view as actually um, motivated by legal liberalism. The history of Frankfurter and the progressive origins of, of abstention should really provide a cautionary tale for legal liberals who believe that the federal judiciary's key function is to protect individual rights against democratic majorities that might compromise them. The Pullman case is a perfect illustration of this point where abstention allowed Frankfurter to dodge a decision on a contentious issue at the Equal Protection Clause um, and avoid deciding this sensitive issue of racial discrimination. Indeed, the uh, point for progressives like Frankfurter was in fact that by moving cases out of federal courts and into the state judiciaries, um, they might get 
results that would delay or completely avoid any adjudication of federal questions. And for a legal liberal who believes that this is perhaps the highest calling of a federal court, this should be troubling. So if originalists um, might perhaps like the historically sensitive uh, vision of the current status quo Supreme Court jurisprudence, distinguished law and equity, a modest abstention doctrine, legal liberals might want to cut it back a third possibility, though, is that we may want more abstention. People who care about judicial restraint, whether progressives left of the center or judicial restraint conservatives on the right, might find in Frankfurter's vision uh, an attractive model for moving, at least on the margins, issues more towards democratically accountable actors. This, uh, pro the progressive origins of abstention might be worth revisiting at a time when, just in the last few months, we've witnessed a flurry of new proposals for how to rein in the federal courts. Maybe Frankfurter's constituency is back. Maybe abstention doctrine could once again be used as a tool for avoiding broad rulings by federal judges in a polarized country. Thank you. OK, good. Thank you to the panel. Um, and my job is provocateur now continues the pace. And I, I want to thank all of our extremely diligent authors for what they've performed. Now let me sort of take the papers in order. Richard, can you move the Oh, move the microphone. And one of the things that, that you know, Vince asked me before about themes, and one of the themes I think that uh, does emerge, uh, particularly with Paul's paper uh, and with your paper, is the sort of ex ante, ex post situation. That is, uh, the way in which Vince organizes his paper, he looks at the bankruptcy world and discovers that the very powerful functions that you see in the way in which bankruptcy works in the private sector, uh, because it stops a genuine prisoner dilemma game and allows you to preserve assets that would otherwise be dissipated, the so-called creditor's bargain, uh, does not have a particular analogy in this particular case. And one of the reasons is we all have the complications of doctrines with sovereign immunity. We know that creditors' remedies against the governments are very large. We also know that the way in which financing runs at the state and municipal level is often less than a model of probity on the way in which responsible fiscal governments ought to be able to handle themselves. Although Vince does not mention it, it's amazing if you start to look at different localities and municipalities faced with common kinds of external shock, the enormous difference in the performance that local governments have had in the way in which they respond to it. So Houston essentially had a huge problem with the energy break in the bubble about 10 years ago. And what it did is it reinvented its own economy, not by having bailouts from the federal government, but by recognizing that it did not want to run a local government or a local system, which is heavily dependent upon a single industry. And so you try to diversify the portfolio uh, of businesses that you get within your particular territory, and that turns out to be a pretty nice hedge against risk. And in fact, although this is not mentioned in the paper, if, if one is trying to figure out what you're dealing with, this diversity, it's not just a question, I think, of local communities having natural accesses by being near to ports or warm weather or whatever it is. It's also, I think, that one ought to take into account very carefully the diversification of the kinds of businesses and activities that start to be there. Uh, the other thing, of course, in this ex ante world that was we were worrying about uh, was the extent to which you try to rely on domestic reforms by way of what we would call liberalization on the one hand, reducing the barriers to entry, the degree of regulation of local economies on the one hand, or the extent to which you're trying to play the game by keeping all of your favorite preferences in place and then trying to stoke up by going to the federal government a cornucopia of uninformed wealth in order to get them to fund the follies that you've managed to engage in. And so, you know, you get Houston on one side, and you get Pittsburgh on that side of the line. You start looking at, you know, exemplary cities like Detroit and like uh, Baltimore and so forth. Baltimore has a very conspicuous feature. It's first in receiving federal subsidies, and it's probably the worst performing city in the face of the United States. People do not remember that Baltimore at the height of segregation in 1950 was a prosperous town with 900,000 people. Uh, after the progressives took over, it lost one third of its population when the national population is doubling, so it's about uh, 600,000, and it's mired in crime and death with occasional white privileged islands in the middle of the place. This is not the kind of portrait uh, that you want to see. So why do I mention all of this stuff? Because I, I think that there's the following argument that Vince does not make, which I would make. 
I don't think, frankly, that the bankruptcy law can do very much to help a locality. Um, uh, the ex post remedies are very, very difficult to put into place. Uh, what happens is he notes in the papers that virtually all the things that local judges team to get done uh, are done sub salento. They're done by influence, intrigue, political pressure, and so forth. It's not because the formal powers are doing this. This is not bargaining in the shadow of the law. This is bargaining at high noon in the middle of the sunshine, right, um, in which essentially there's a free going on. It's very difficult to figure out what's going on. The second problem I think that one has with this particular situation is what you're saying is you're trying to uh, sort of protect investment by getting rid of the overhang of previous debt from somebody else. Uh, essentially, the way in which you have to model this is you assume that people come into town, and one of the things they're going to have to do is to pay for real estate taxes. And these real estate taxes essentially have two components associated with it. Well, one of them is to pay off past debts that have to be done in order to keep somebody at bay. We're never quite sure who, but somebody. And then there are others which are designed to provide return services for the people who enter into the particular community. If it turns out that you're doing too much on the first side of this stuff, there's not enough money on the second side of this stuff, and it's going to be extremely difficult to get business to come into a particular kind of local community and come up with the brilliant conclusion uh, that they want to essentially subsidize past mistakes out of there. Well, that's why you want to get rid of the overhang. The problem is uh, now what's going to go in there, you want to get these new guys, you want to get this first generation of guys to come in to lend money and to do things. Uh, the difficulty you have is if you've got a bankruptcy law, what you're doing is you're upsetting the basically the estimations and the people at the first part of the particular cycle. Uh, they're going to say, why should I go into this particular system if it turns out that there's going to be a strong bankruptcy law and I can be forced into some kind of reorganization, compromise my debt, and we don't have any real strong allocative model, which is explaining why we're doing this, I, I think. It's, well, let's put it another way. Uh, what's left with the spatial model is everything that's, that's taken out is the creditor's bargain model and the prisoner's dilemma game. You're basically losing an order of magnitude. It may be a legitimate function, but if it's going to distort the market in previous times uh, in order to get things done in the ex post state of the world, it's just not at all clear to me that you're looking in the right place. So the, the basic intuition, and I think what his next paper should be, is the paper on the futility of, of municipal bankruptcy optimally organized, as he would probably do it, because he's certainly right about the critiques. And then the question is studying what it is are the determinants in local governments, which figure out what this incredible high variation is with respect to their performance, because the one thing we know it's not attributable is the bankruptcy law. It's obviously attributable to all sorts of other things, and I think it would be really very, very useful um, to branch out from bankruptcy to do it. Now, when it comes to Lance's paper, we also have an ex ante ex post problem of, of major performance, and we also have a delegated authority problem, which I think are both perfectly legitimate type situations. One of the things I, I think that he's clearly right about is, is you have to be extremely careful about the way in which you read the uh, first three articles of the Constitution. Uh, we say what we do is we have a legislative power, they make laws, right? And then we have an executive power that enforces laws, and then we have a judiciary power. Problem is, government's a hell of a lot more complicated than that. And, and the basic feature that you see in terms of the way in which these governments uh, turn out to be organized is they're doing multiple things, some of which are not particularly, obviously, legislation under Article I. So I actually read the Constitution. Um, and, you know, try, I can't find it now, but I'll find it one of, one of these years. And you're trying to figure out exactly what it is uh, that the Congress could do. And amongst other things, it could say every order resolution of vote which, to which the concurrence of the Senate and the House of Representatives may be necessary. Well, the negative correlative of that position is there are some orders, resolutions, or votes for which the concurrence of the two houses are not necessary. Well, what are they? And I think, you know, it'd be nice for somebody to figure it out. This is, I think, a serious problem with respect to charter, because if you look at the one house veto, you don't think of it as a legislation. What you're doing is you're making orders and so forth. You may not have to do it for that precisely because it's not legislation. And so this is a kind of check and balance, uh, which is non-legislative given to the legislative branch. Um, and if you look at the rest of Article One, there's half of it, the last two clauses, uh, sections are dealing with limitations on state governments, right, which is not a legislative function at all. So I think, in effect, that he's clearly on to something. 
um, when he starts to say that the characterization isn't there. And I think uh, this is a textual hook, which I don't think you mentioned in the paper, um, but I think it actually does give rise to a serious problem. And I think the founders understood this problem, uh, and they basically say, you know, Gaul is divided into two parts, not three. Uh, but what they don't do is to tell us what's in which of these two particular parts. But I would make the fairly powerful argument uh, that if you're dealing with the property cause and the disposition of property, um, you could make an argument that that is not legislation, and therefore all of the usual rules don't go. So what follows from this, however, is not at all clear because of the ex ante, ex post problem. Um, Generally, whenever I hear the word deference, I, I get a vague case of the willies and the ills. Um, uh, that is, I'm an anti-Chevron guy down to my core. Um, I believe, in effect, that uh, the basic structure of the Administrative Procedure Act is to basically put the administrative procedures as some cross between the trial court on the one hand and the jury on the other, and that when you go up the ladder to the courts, the appellate review on questions of law no deference whatsoever, mixed questions of law and fact, get some pure questions of fact with credibility and witness testimony there, you get a lot, and so you go to arbitrary and capricious at the bottom, and de novo review at the top, and this middle category is treated in the middle way. I think that's the way in which to do it. And I see here the problem is as follows. Uh, I know best the Obama version of this. I, I mean, I'm happy to believe in her earlier. And you know, this is protecting the antiquities. Uh, if you're going to start to tell me that an antiquity includes a historic scenic landscape of great proportions, my attitude to you is, is that you do not know what the English language means, or you choose to ignore everything that it does mean. And I mean, Obama, you know, he was smoother than Trump, but much more disreputable in the sense of using his power, the pen and the phone, to what I regard as totally illegitimate function. So the question about deference has got the following two-edged stuff. If you're going to give Obama deference so that he could put this thing into place, and then you have to give the second guy deference so he could take it out of place. And so I would allow him to reverse it. The question you say is then Congress has the power to oversee this. Well, the question you have to ask is if Congress says, no, 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 Mr. Obama, we don't want to do this. The year is still 2016. They pass a legislation reversing the Bears' use designation, and he vetoes it. What next? Um, I don't think that there's an answer that's being given to that question. But if, in fact, you treat it the way in which I do it, which is this is something that coming back to you as a resolution or an order, and that it doesn't require bicameralism and presentment to get it through, uh, then the Congress should be able to veto this thing without having to work through the president again, because it becomes kind of an absurdity to say, we're giving you this second check, and oh, by the way, it's subject to a veto, so if you do it by majority rule, we can always get you, unless you get two-thirds of both houses working. And I don't think you talk about those relationships enough in the paper, but I really, really think um, that that is something that you have to do. And, and the second question is, why is this only a battle uh, that is going to exist between the president and the Congress. There are folks like you and me out there, and I'm a guy in the West, and I see what's going on, and I see there's a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress, and these guys are dancing around announcing that sunsets turn out to be national antiquities. This is the narrowest area that we can draw. I mean, I think as a, an ordinary textual matter, you have to be irresponsible to argue that Obama was acting in good faith or when he did this thing. Even the Trump cutback wasn't far enough. My view about this is what you do is you put a nice little fence around this thing, and you give people enough room to come in and walk in and out of the particular monument that you want, and to put a restaurant or a delicatessen nearby uh, just to spruce up the particular site. And so one million acres becomes 10 acres if the monument is one acre. So you're off by two orders of magnitude. Well, I think judicial review should be done on the anti-Chevron mark. And it's not that it should be done for Trump, uh, but it should be done for Obama in the first instance. Uh, because, you know, if we started to talk about the kinds of papers that Elon presented, right, a man of blessed memory, uh, dealing with these kinds of issues, uh, what he said is that this is kind of ultra virus, the statute, and so forth. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. And I don't see why it is that the role of the court should differ fundamentally when you're dealing with resolutions and orders from those cases in which it starts to be dealing with legislation. So I come up with the exact opposite conclusion. And what I would do is I would say, I think you really have to say you need a uniform standard for first and second stage issues. 
you don't get to the second stage issue if there's an effective judicial challenge of the Obama thing. You win on summary judgment if there's any kind of decent review. So you don't have to worry about the revocation. You take it down. What do you do? Well, you just strike it down and say, Mr. President, you can now try it again and see if you can come up with something that's a little bit better. And by the time you go from 10 million down to 10 acres, uh, you may have gotten uh, closer to the right situation. But I regard this as a complete abuse. I, there, I might also add just the last point. There are also other historical preservation statutes out there which you might want to consider in so that when you want to put projects up, uh, you have to consult with Indian tribes and so forth in order to handle that. So this is not the only mechanism that you have which changes the way you look at it. Now, when we come to Lyle's paper, again, I mean, I think Frankfurt is perfectly consistent as between his two halves. And, and I think there's a part of you which thinks that that may not be the particular case. Uh, but let's go into what the Frankfurtian position is uh, with respect to substance. And you know, to describe this man as being hostile uh, to the Lochner version of the United States Supreme Court is to sort of understate what's going on. It is very, very clear, for example, that Frankfurter, when it came to all of this stuff, he regarded the collective bargaining it, that's before he got on the court, but before, as, as a kind of a salvation. It, it's, it's a biblical command of momentous proportions that every sane person has to agree and to accept. And my favorite statement of him is in something that called the Yale Review, it wasn't the Law Review, in which he announced why it was that he thought that Pierce and Meyer, the two cases on substantive due process and religious liberty, then they were substantive due process cases. Today they are now religious liberty cases. Um, his attitude is, I can't possibly support them uh, because if we start giving individual rights in these cases, what's going to happen to my beloved project when it comes to having collective bargaining rule the roost with respect to labor regulation? He thought that the substantive due process claim in one area would spill over to another. I think he was actually right about that, but that explains why he was wrong on the labor cases and the religion cases rather than explain why he was right with respect to both of them. And he was perfectly consistent with this. He did not want this at the federal level. He did not want it at the state level. Um, he didn't write Atkins against the Children's Hospital. It was Sutherland and Taft wrote the dissent. Uh, but that's a case in which you don't have incorporation because it's the District of Columbia. The police power, Pache, Mr. Werman again, absolutely constant across the federal and the state cases on these issues. And Frankfurter was one of the guys who went into orbit um, at what went on in this particular case. And Taft went on with him. Taft, there was a switch uh, because he had come out the other way on the rent control cases a couple of years earlier and then wrote the opinion for the court in the Wolf Parking case, which had to do with really compulsory uh, you know, labor negotiations, distinguished from the Collective Labor Negotiation Act. This is the Employee Free Choice Act at the state level done there. So Frankfurter, he was basically all in favor of whatever you could do to sort of maximize these kinds of things. And that's a substantive commitment. The stuff on Pullman, I had not realized what the facts were. Uh, but one of the things is that this is not the only case in which a corrupt racial motive tends to alter the peripheral stuff. Go back and read uh, Conley against Gibson on civil procedure. And this is a last five years still battle over the duty of fair representation of labor unions to represent minority workers when they were forced to amalgamate wrongly under the Railway Labor Act of 1926. And uh, they were trying to basically get out of their fiduciary duties, and he blew a gut. And so when I look at this opinion, I see two things. I see abstention. Well, that's generally not a bad idea. Let them interpret it. But in the context of a statute like this one, where essentially a categorical exclusion of people from race, I read it in a slightly different way. I'm a gutless wonder. My name is Felix Frankfurter. Um, I'm going to basically be a gutless gunder when it comes to gobitis, which is coming down at exactly the same time. What I'm going to do is adopt any particular doctrine that takes forward, which doesn't require me to take a moral stand on anything. Um, because I don't think there's any need whatsoever for abstention in that case. I would qualify the doctrine the saying, I think there has to be some <laughs> genuine, bona fide, colorable ambiguity in the case before you defer back. And I don't think that's part of the way in which he did it. So I, I don't give him hero's reward. Do I think it's a bad solution if you're actually looking at it apart from that? Well, I do think, in fact, it is. But it's not necessary to have an abstention doctrine, which is coercive. What I think you have to do is to consider the alternative, uh, which is what happens is you give the federal judges if they think there's a problem, the option to kick it back to the state courts to get some kind of decision on the issue before you go forward, 
Uh, so it becomes a discretionary rather than a mandatory doctrine. It's not clear to me which of these two things is the dominant solution. I think you might want to talk about that a bit more in this particular paper. Uh, but what I think perfectly clear is that the point that he had on the procedural stuff is, is Frankfurter was a, a traditional proceduralist. Um, you go to the McNabb case in 43 and so forth, and you know, all of a sudden it's anti-star chamber stuff with respect to criminal procedure, right? He was a great believer in, in, in kinds of regularities. And in fact, it ties in, and I'll end on this note, with the administrative state in the following way. You get rid of classical liberal notions. And you've got this administrative state with all sorts of crazy forms of discretion where it can have wealth transfer arrangements you know, of the sort that Yolande's courts condemn, or you can have legitimate situations. And the whole purpose of the Administrative Procedure Act and constitutional doctrine is to take in a domain of positive rights some way to tame this particular monster. Uh, so that it will do the right thing more often than the wrong thing. I think that's what he's after. And what you therefore hope to do is to kind of do this. And, and the, the dominant feature, and this is, I think, something you should mention, is all this stuff is coming up in the early 40s. It doesn't have a legislative revolution resolution because the war intervenes. And courts can continue to decide cases, and there are many of them like Hearst and so forth. But the legislature only gets back into business in 1946, and it's clear the National Labor Relations Act is a complete failure. Uh, because industrial peace was followed by a strike wave, nobody could figure out what to do. And they never asked me, I was three at the time, but I would have told them, <laughs> which is the only way to solve this particular problem is to repeal the National Labor Relations Act and go back to the pre-order. And when I announced that at the Yale Law School in 1938, there was a modest riot in the room, uh, but it's still the correct solution. But what they did is what Republicans everywhere always do, which is you, the Democrats, go from zero to 10, we, the Republicans, go from 10 to six, right? <laughs> It's never a question, oh, you get us to 10, and we're going to go right back to zero. So it's the minimum wage debate. You want to raise it $2, we want to raise it $1. And that's the way in which these political debates start to play out. Frankfurter was actually, the more he was a judge, the more he became uncomfortable with all of this stuff, right? And by the time he reached the mid-50s, he's an anti-labor guy. And I think you might want to just take the accommodation a little bit further with the secondary picketing sites and the 54 decisions and so forth to do that. So I'm done. Yes, sir. You're done. Oh, did I get the right time? <laughs> we, you know, you were right on time. Um, I'm sorry. So, uh, so why don't we, we have about 20 minutes for questions so people in the audience can interrogate people up here. So come on, let the interrogation begin. Oh, for God's sake. <coughs> Good. Uh, John? You... I have a question for Jeff Hart. And this is, how, however you account for the conclusion that the executive can have very broad discretion with respect to the administrative power doctrine, what do you think that's, what do you think that's because <coughs> there are uh, four powers of government rather than three, an administrative one, or you just say that the allocation of between, between executive and legislative includes in the idea of the executive power that one of the things executive, <coughs> is, is, executive officials do is exercise discretion with respect to the administration of public resources, like the public lands. How, however you account for that. What I'm wondering is, does that apply or can that apply to intangibles, for example, suppose that it's permissible for Congress to, to in effect, make control over the airwaves, considering them as a resource, metaphorically mm -hmm. speaking, public. That is, by forbidding broadcasting without a license. As they did. As, exactly, as they did. Frankfurt. Can, can, can the distribution of those licenses be put in the discretion of the executive on the grounds that executive power includes the exercise of discretion with respect to the administration of the resources of the government, and once the right to broadcast has been turned from private into a public right through the imposition of the general ban on broadcasting without permission from the government, it is therefore necessary to have the government's permission, just like, say, giving a lease of the material of the real property of the government. Does the, does the conclusion about, if you think there's a non-delegation principle, it's not applying, 
when publicly held resources are being administered, does that carry over into intangibles, in particular this intangible? Um, let me say two things in response, and I hope that they evidence understanding of your question. But um, the the one of the moves that I hint at in this paper is to make a distinction between administrative and legislative power, but I don't necessarily flesh that out totally. Um, and that distinction is important to me in terms of what the courts can do to step in and sort of dis referee the dispute if there is one between the political branches. Um, and so if, 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 we, if a court can classify what Congress is doing as administrative, then that's where I see courts taking a more hands-off approach. So, and I don't know if that applies to your fact situation entirely. Um, but the other distinction, or not distinction, that I, that I make uh, in this paper the, is an investigation of the property clause from a historical point of view. Um, and the property clause, I think the historical record shows, is pretty much real estate. And I'm not sure that you can extend that to other things. So I think your question is if, if it's something that becomes public and supposed to a private right, does that affect the analysis? I haven't looked at it. I don't think so. Um, but my, my initial gut reaction is no. Yeah, I do think just to comment on this, and, uh, and it's actually a question to Lyle as well, which is the 1942 decision in the NBC case raises exactly that question. What it did is you had this grant by Congress to the public interest convenience and necessity. And Frankfurter was given the proposition that that means what you do is you establish property rights, interference barriers, and so forth, and you sell these things off. And of course, the, F, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, wanted to do far more. And Frankfurter was very conscious in saying, uh, you guys really think that this means the setting up the rules of the road. That's the sort of laissez-faire libertarianism which he disdained. And we think public interest and contestancy gives us the power to determine the composition of the traffic, so what we're doing. And so he did treat this as a non-delegation challenge, and he found that you met the particular test in question. And he said, I'm confident that the FCC can result in this particular rules. And of course, it was an abject failure. Uh, but they did as they said, well, uh, one of the factors that you want to do is you're very good on national coverage. That's a plus. And then somebody else says, I've got an application, and he's very good on local matters. That's a plus, too. Uh, so it turns out no matter what you did, you always got credits at demerit. And it, nobody could ever figure out what went on. And then the moment the license was given to the first guy, what he did is he could sell it off at bid and keep all the money and divert it from the public treasury. It was the way the system actually played out. And so forth. And I do think that if you're wrong to say it can't. It was Historically, there's no question it's excess property like that. But the government did claim the ownership of the spectrum on these particular cases. It didn't claim, we only have the power to regulate it, but we don't have the power to take it in, because they wanted to give large chunks of it in the 1912 allocation uh, to ship to shore radio and so forth. By the way, those allocations from under the 1912 Act are still good law today, um, because they never got shifted, because you can't sell spectrum across use categories and so forth. So you can't take the sheriff's band and sell it off to the wireless companies. And so the utilization's there as opposed to 5,000 times as much of the other band. So I think, in effect, this is Frankfurter in the administrative state, right? And, you know, this is, this is the Lochner side of Frankfurter, right? This is not the procedural side of Frankfurter. And it turns out, on, on that particular side, I, I think the verdict of history is is really very strong against them. And what I would urge you to do is to say that the property clause covers all forms of property, just the way the takings clause really covers, if the government wants to take intellectual property, a patent right, starting in the 19th century when the issue was that, of course it covers uh, patents, covers trade secrets, covers other stuff. I think you can do by responsible analogy an extension into that particular area. And then you, well, your position is essentially is consistent with the Frankfurter ones, because what you call deference, he calls essentially uh, the mandate was broad enough to accommodate whatever you want to do, even though nobody wants to do it. Now, is that your reading of these cases? Um, so I, I can't claim to have a, uh, hmm. any, a, a deep reading of Frankfurter on, on uh, the spectrum. But um, I, I think he, he definitely was very deferential to, you know, he saw the administrative state as a positively 
good thing. Yeah. Um, and so that <clears throat> this again goes to his democratic versus um, mm. judicial distinction yeah. too, which he cared about throughout his whole life. That if we can have democratically created specialist agencies, these will be appropriate mm -hmm. me methods of kind of adjudicating these things. We want to get this out of the courts. We want to get this into um, agencies and fora yeah. that are that end up going through democratic branches. So, I mean, if you do the biography of, of Frankfurter, which you might want to do, yeah. he's a very different judge from 1939 to say about 1946 mm -hmm. uh, through the revision of the Administrative Procedure Act than he is by the time he gets into the 1950s where he becomes something of a judicial restraint guy, right? Or uh, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing sort of guy as opposed to somebody who was really much more of a, had a positive program early on in his career. Okay, so. So that would be one area um, where I would say, I, th I view him as more consistent across this era, where I thought, I, I, I view him as very much a judicial restraint guy across his career, and it's more that the court moved rather than Frankfurter moving. I'm not, I'm, there's a different set of problems, of course, obviously. Yeah. Nobody yeah. became a judicial guy, you know, restraint guy on Brown v. Board. Right? True. Any, any more questions from the audience? Yeah, Jean? Yes, you do. <laughs> I just wondered if anybody wanted to uh, quarrel significantly with anything that Richard said about their papers. So I thought I would <laughs> throw that open to all of you. <coughs> yes. <No. laughs> I can't quarrel with my own paper. Right. Yes, go ahead, Vince. Uh, my view is that's not the appropriate way of. Uh, of dealing with Richard comments. <laughs> I think you, when Richard comments on something, whether I think it's a fair characterization of the opinion or not, you just surf it. And uh, that's, that's how I learned the most anyway. <laughs> okay. I mean, you spent how many years working on municipal bankruptcy? And I spent how many minutes working on the same topic? <laughs> Come on, go Oh, oh I, I, I'm not going to go go after Richard, but I think Richard, when he, and this was a long time ago, so half of you may not have even been here when Richard was commenting on my paper, but he was mostly commenting on the, on the Stanford paper where right. I claim that officers of the United States is a broad definition. Richard said that creates a massive scaling problem and how could the um, person who um, checked him in and frisked him at the airport today no, be... <laughs> Be, be an officer of the United States. And so I, I, all I was going to point out about, and this is, again, still talking about the old paper, not really the one here to, here today, but that I think I think sometimes we wrongly see this kind of black-white distinction between um, officers and employees, and that actually a fair amount of the work, uh, most of the work of the hiring and the vetting can actually be delegated down. And so it's what we're talking about with, the, with people being subject to the appointments clause is the head of the department or the president having to have accountability at the top and signing off. And one way to illustrate maybe how this, this would work, um, first of all, is, is if you look at the appointments clause, Congress can establish by law offices. So, you know, it seems as though historically the understanding was that Congress could put um, certain qualifications to a degree at least on who could serve as an officer. So perhaps, and there was a debate as late as 1871 over what do we do with clerks who even that late in, record keeping clerks were seen as officers subject to the appointments clause. And the question is, what do we do about the Pendleton yeah. civil service reform? And the question was, well, maybe, you know, if we um, leave the head of the Department of Choice between three top ranking clerks, that's fine, or, or a larger group than just one. But the idea is that you can have some kind of merit-based selection, you can have objective criteria, you can have a selection system in place as long as there's sufficient discretion at the top. And I think the government actually now is having to work through this with the administrative law judges who were found to be officers of the United States yeah. by the court in June. And then the Trump administration passed an executive order exempting them from the traditional civil service system. But what's interesting is as agencies are starting to treat ALJs as officers, the Department of Labor, for example, is actually put into place a very civil service system like system where they have a kind of a nominations board of various officials. They have uh, objective criteria they're using to examine these AL new ALJ candidates. It's just at the end of the day, the labor secretary gets to either pick from the recommended candidates. They're not appointed candidates at the lower level. They're recommended and say whether he wants to pick from those or send everybody back to the drawing board. And I think you could even imagine a situation where perhaps the person at the top would say, well, I just as a matter of practice am going to you know, always just myself choose to pick the top ranked candidate or, you know, that kind of thing. And, and that 
and, and that, and that the, the system does not need to be as cumbersome or um, unwieldy, perhaps, um, I think as Richard that, proposed earlier today, no. as long as there's accountability on the top. And some might, if I could just say one last point, some might say, well, then that undoes all the accountability. And I think that's not really true as long as we hold the department head accountable for whatever system that person puts into place. So then that person cannot any longer say, oh, this ALJ stole all this money. Oh, the Office of Personnel Management didn't vet them properly. Or my hiring board didn't vet them properly. The secretary has to take responsibility and say, I put the system in place. Um, and so I'm ultimately responsible for what this person. And therefore, and therefore what? What do you I'm mean? Fired. Yes. I'm yeah. Well. Or well. Or or his his stature goes down in the eyes of the president or whatever. I mean, it may not be a perfect. The sword of Damocles may not impact him every time he makes a misstep. But he, at the end of the day, he's held accountable on some level for the Can personnel I ask underneath you one other him. Question? Yes. Um, in Morrison v. Olson, they said interbranch appointments are appropriate so that the courts of law who are outside the political system can appoint a special prosecutor. I always thought that that was a horrendous mistake and that you, by any stretch of the imagination, never want to give unaccountable judicial people the chance to make political appointments, whether or not her name is Alexa Morrison. Uh, what side, do, which way do you come down on that interbranch appointment question? Yeah, so I, I think probably um, I, I take more Akhil Mars position in well, contextualism. Okay, and well, and and also, I think other founding era evidence suggests that the inferior officer concept was, was that the was that the um, executive branch would be the department head would be appointing the lower level inferior. So officers. is that you're against the transfer? I am against the idea that courts of law can appoint executive officials. So am I. Well, and so is Akhil Amar. Oh yeah, but I mean, I, I don't know if we're so doing it for exactly the we, same we, reason, but structurally, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, the last thing you want to do is to give somebody the power to appoint when they don't have the power to oversee. That's right. That's right. And then I think structurally from the text yeah, of the Yeah, and so I mean, I, I thought Rehnquist was one of his worst opinions. And that was one of his worst features of one of his worst opinions. And he sounds like an apologist for the administrative state rather than an independent judge uh, doing his job. Morrison versus Olson is very troubling. It was always it was a terrible yes. decision. And I mean, we see the same problem with Miller similar ways, although that's within the branch appointment. There you have a conflict of interest question, right? I'm going to refrain from uh, I'm not going to refrain from it. <laughs> I will never refrain from attacking Mr. Mueller at any opportunity that I have uh, on the grounds he should have never taken the commission because he's buddies with people who are material witnesses in the case. we got about three more minutes, so hey, yeah. So this is for Paul. Um, could you say a little bit more about how the temporalization would happen in terms of the, the collateral <coughs> consequences uh, and how that could be done sort of relatively objectively. Um, like, would you need a, a, a collateralization guidelines? And if so, would it have to be advisory? Uh, there's a lot packed in there. First of all, I just want to say the temporalization phrase, I'm going to steal that, Richard. I like that. That was very nice. Free gift. <laughs> um, thanks for that question, Anthony. I, so I guess the first thing I would say is it would be an objective analysis as opposed to subjective. And so what do I mean by that? You wouldn't, you, you would want to, or I would, I would urge, propose courts or legislatures especially to get involved by when picking between those four categories I mentioned to take an objective approach, which is what we do with imprisonment, right? We don't ask like, is one day in prison gonna be particularly hard or particularly you know, sufferable or insufferable, right? We sort of just make general assessments and it's not gonna be the same for everybody. So the same for each cloud consequence. After that, the, the sort of thing that I um, and then this could be an area of reasonable disagreement for sure, is the sort of degree of infringement on constitutional recognized liberty, is sort of the garbly gook phrase that I'm trying to, to, but what is it about imprisonment that is sort of our touchstone for so long and in so many ways? That leads to really difficult questions, though. For instance, you know, losing public benefits can be a tremendously significant thing. But it might not register in the sort of temporalization that high in terms of imprisonment. Um, and uh, at least in a constitutional sense, I mean, legislatures can approach it differently. So that's sort of, I guess, the, the big picture approach. So for instance, 
being deported, I would say, counts as more than a year of imprisonment. And we, there's, I think, my guess is there's at least, that's a reasonable position. And maybe lifetime registration as a sex offender and all the things that go with it, maybe more than a year oh, or maybe is. six months to one year. And I mean, just ask yourself the question. Would somebody rather have two years in jail and not have to register under SORNA? Or they have one year in jail and register under SORNA and be a pariah for the next 45 years of your life, even after you're impotent. Well, nice. yeah. <laughs> on that note, <laughs> on that note, I give give everyone uh, your applause here. <laughs> I mean, of course, that's a nice way of doing it. That is a nice way. No, that's not right. You should put it into the paper. Yeah. Which I'll even see that when they claim uh, ineffective assistance.